the Leadership Society series, People and Planet in the Information Era. And today I'm discussing how tech defines us with Professor Kate Eichhorn, Chair and Professor of Culture and Media at the New School. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for the invitation. Good. So I'm going to just jump right in. In your recent book, Content, you describe a shift in the way culture products are produced and consumed. And you wrote that in an age of consent, I'm sorry, an age of content, content isn't just something needed to promote one's art. Increasingly, content is art, or at least what has come to stand in for art. When you say content, can you describe what that is? You know, I wish I could give you a really fantastic definition of content. Um, so a bit of a backstory. I started to, like most of, of us, you know, start to hear this word increasingly around 2010, 2011. It was maybe 2017 or 2018. I was on a panel, which is actually with the, both people from information studies and people from media studies. And it was a panel about information. How do you define information? How is information different than data? And I realized on that panel that even scholars interrogating the idea of information were beginning to use this word content, but none of us really could define it. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna to try to write a book, a short book about this concept. And I wish I could now give you a really fantastic definition, but even after writing the book, I still, I still don't know if I could give you a great definition of what content is. What I can say is that it is very context specific. So you can take something that also circulates as a film or an artwork or a piece of literature, but in a particular context, it can be redeployed as, as content. But we also know simultaneous to that, over the last 20, 25 years, there is a lot of stuff, let's call it, on the internet that was just produced as content. It was just purely produced not to convey a message or share information. It was purely produced for the sake of circulation itself. So content is both of those things. So there's content that's been redeployed and becomes content because of the context. And then there's also just all of that kind of clickbait and different forms of online material that was produced just to create a frame basically for advertising. I see. I, I'm, I'm curious about this. So let's think about radio. So that's been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, it, there was always a sense that like top 40 was being used more to advertise things than it was for the art. Not to say there wasn't art and music. Is that content? Was that content then? Like, what's the difference between content and art? Is it just the use that it's put to? That's a good, that's a good question. I mean, I, I use the example in my book, if you are an executive at Netflix or Amazon Prime, you might look at a film by Agnes Varda or Jean-Luc Godard and refer to it as content because all it is for you is it's content for your streaming platform. If you talk to one of my colleagues in film studies, they're not gonna refer to those films as content. So it is, content is, has, seems to have something to do with how it's being used and why. And that's why it's actually very difficult to define because mm -hmm. you have content that's just created to be content and then you have basically anything else, particularly anything else that's streamable, that ha can now be redeployed as content. Hmm. So it seems like when you say content, you just it's used to fill some channel, it's used to advertise something else. Is it just not things that are created for the intrinsic value of the thing itself? Is that is that what we're talking about? In some cases, but then you run into this problem where you have something that was actually, you know, produced as art, right. um, as literature, that also gets redeployed by the content industry. And what happens in the process is lots of the, many of the classifications that we once took for granted, we used to define things in the basis of genre, or we used to define things on the basis of format all of those things get sort of flattened out. Everything sort of gets put into the same, the same pile. 
so to speak. And that creates some collapse of, it's not just a collapse of categories. There's some important distinguishing features um, that disappear. And then when you start to talk about things like misinformation and disinformation, the consequences of that become a bit more dire. Can you say a little bit more about that? So why, why is, what are the consequences when you, when you talk about misinformation and disinformation? So in the past, we've always had misinformation and disinformation. There's nothing new about those things, but it usually costs people, so you have to invest in order to produce that misinformation and disinformation. And it was fairly difficult for the average person to circulate it wild, widely. Mm -hmm. In an era of content, um, it's pretty easy and very inexpensive for anyone to circulate misinformation or disinformation. But another thing has happened. During the 2016 presidential election, we know that a certain amount of misinformation and disinformation came out of troll factories in Russia. But there was also that really weird story of the Macedonian teenagers who discovered they, they wanted to make money online, right? Like lots of folks um, had a domain and they realized that the articles that would get the most views and clicks and therefore produce the most, generate the most revenue on AdSense happened to be articles about the US presidential election. And if they threw in something that was highly salacious, those articles would even perform better. And so, it's an example of how misinformation and disinformation also now can be easily monetized. So there's actually an incentive to produce that kind of content. And that mm. has had fairly grave consequences for democracy, not just in the United States, but globally, this is something that we're grappling with. I see. I'm, I want to come back to the that in a bit. But first, I want to go back to the content creation. Um, and you've talked about how artists have to commodify their selves along with their art. Can you can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, again, this is a, you know, I've been thinking about this question for quite some time, probably since the early 2000s. I started to see this impact of the content industry on poetry, visual arts, different, different art films, but particularly literature and visual arts. And one of the things I, I, I wrote about in my last book is a shift from the field of cultural production to what I call the field of, of, of you know, content production. Essentially, um, in order to, in the past, if you were a visual artist, you know, you'd be making your art, eventually maybe you'd have a big show and this would sort of catapult you into, you'd get great reviews and this would catapult you into, you know, a new stage in your art career. Increasingly, people are, before they have their first gallery show or museum show, they're actually discovered on a platform like Instagram. Producing content, not necessarily about their artwork, but about themselves as artists has become particularly important. Um, and some might argue specifically for women artists. There's an incredible demand on them to produce content about themselves. And so if I talk to my students who are now almost all um, born in the 2000s and beyond, you know, so since, since, since 2000, I should say, they would say that in a way this, inc this is incredibly democratizing, right? So as opposed to having to go through all the gatekeeping mechanisms that once determined, you know, who, who could have a very successful career as a writer or artist, this is now from their perspective in your hands, right? You can control um, and even circumvent a lot of the gatekeeping that used to exist in both the literature and art worlds. Um, on the flip side of that, there is something sort of troubling about the extent to which artists and, and writers now have to produce content about themselves. Mm. So as opposed to focusing on their writing or art, they're really focusing on creating this kind of 
online content about themselves as writers and artists. It's as if they are, you know, some of the gatekeeping mechanisms have collapsed, but it's been replaced um, by creating a situation where artists and writers have to be their own, their own content directors, their own content producers, their own marketers. Mm -hmm. And so some, to some extent what's happening is, and I don't know if this is new, you can tell me if you think this is new, but the artist has become part of the content itself. Mm -hmm. So it's it's this is what you think you're saying about social media, that they are um, presenting themselves as much as the art as part of the self-promotion necessary to become successful. Is that is that fair? Um, particularly for women artists. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's an incredible pressure on on. Um, women in the visual arts, younger women to produce content about themselves. Um, so they're sort of part part of the package. And it's, you know, I, I don't want to be, again, because I, I, I listen to, <laughs> I work with a lot, I work at a school with a very large art program. I work with a lot of emerging artists and they're not entirely negative about this shift. And I want to honor their perspective. But it does seem that the artists themselves needs to, Put themselves out there and create a kind of following online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, you know what's interesting about this is when you collapse art and artists, you end up in a in a strange place to some extent. So right now, there's been a lot of talk about, say, J.K. Rowling or Raul Dahl, and this is kind of the um, in the space of literature, or at least in in writing. How should we think about? the separation of the art and artist, given what you're saying. So if a, an artist is seen as problematic, should should that, from your perspective, I know this is a strange question when I say should, but should that, from your perspective, um, or in this world where content and artists get com compressed, should that change how we think about the art? Is that part of the art then, their, their, their person? I mean, ideally, it it, it isn't. Right. Like ideally we should be able to to not we've spent, you know, if we go back to the sort of theoretical, you know, dominant theoretical trends in the late in the 80s and 90s and into the early 2000s, certainly reading reading a work of art or a, a work of literature through the lens, the biographical lens of the writer or artist was something that we rejected. Um, but I would agree that it's more difficult to do that in this era where the, you know, for, there's this incredible sort of pressure on particularly emerging artists and writers to have themselves at the center of the body of work they're creating. Mm -hmm. And what's the, what's the outcome of this? I mean, if you see this, this continuing, let's say this um, flattening of, art and artist, right? This all all moving towards, in some sense, what you would call, I think, content. What does that do about, what does that do to art, I guess, is the question. And this is, I, this is, I feel like this is getting very abstract, but I guess <laughs> what I'm asking you is, um, <laughs> what is the function of art, right? And so when we think about people in plan in the, in the information era, like art, plays a role in, in the human experience. So I guess the first question is, what do you think that role is like? What's the point of art? That's, if I could answer that question, Brian, I would have, I'd have an, you know, I would, I would just teach one course a year and, you know, spend the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm be teaching at a liberal arts college with a two, three load. Um, no, I mean, I, I can't answer, I can't answer that question, but if you're asking me, what do I think is the danger of this path that we're going down? Um, and maybe this is really purist, but I don't think that if you are an innovative poet or you're, you know, an, an artist working in a, a, a non, you know, producing work that ha doesn't have a lot of commercial value, that I, I, I want to preserve a space for people to engage in that work. Mm. And, you know, because so much of what happens on 
all of these social media platforms is so driven by the economy, it does create a more narrow space for artists and writers, and other, you know, cultural workers to, to operate in. I would also say it's the case, and this is a bit of a generalization, but the, the you know, recent reports, particularly in the visual arts world, would, would say that this is bearing out, it's true, that the same, you know, women, often young women, who would be successful influencers because they're very, they're, they're cisgender, they're white, they're thin, they meet all of those criteria, seem to also have a lot of success having their work taken up when they put it online. And, you know, it leads to shows, it leads to, you know, great prices at art auctions. And I don't want to take any of that success away from people who are using this to their advantage. Because again, my students would say, this is great because some of those women, you know, would not have been able to be where they are before the emergence of, before they were able to take all of this in, into their own hands, so to speak. Um, but I do think we need to be aware of the fact that certain people can leverage those platforms more successfully than others. And it's about gender, it's about race, it's about your location in the world, it's about a whole number of factors. Um, because at the end of the day, this is going to sound very cynical, I do think that there are certain kinds of relations of ruling that are reproduced on social media platforms. So the problem isn't social media, the problem is the extent to which these platforms have a tendency to reproduce inequities, practices, stereotypes that I think a lot of us would like to challenge. Mm. No, that, that seems, um, that's compelling to me. I, I guess when I thought, and going back to the original question, when I think about art and artists, I I would like to separate them. I don't know, that's probably not surprising. Um, and I think of art as something that elevates and expands, right? It gives you a, a different view into the world through some other perspective and it helps you think about the world in, in more interesting, maybe ways or deeper ways. Um, and to me, if you don't separate art and artists, it seems like what you really then end up with are, are heroes and villains or, in or something in between, as opposed to perspectives that you can take on yourself, right? I, I, I just want, I just, I guess I, I wonder and, and worry about that in the way you're describing this kind of collapse. Um, of art and content or artist and, and content. Um, and and I, I do want to take, take it back up to where you were on the technology in terms of the um, kind of supporting the existing systems and biases and um, go to it in a slightly different direction. Like what are the consequences you see for, as you pointed out, the younger generations dealing with these new um, platforms and social media like what do you what do you see as the as you think about the your students the ones who apparently were born in two thousand or later? <laughs> um, what do you see as as the consequences for this generation given the the move towards or the the, the shift towards social media? I mean, there have been consequences for for all of us. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's just age age related. I mean, I guess I'll throw the, the question back at you, Brian. Are you implying that the consequences are negative? Good <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, I think that seems to be what you're asking me. It's like what and I'm I'm very cautious as a media studies scholar um, to, you know, not assume that the technologies can't be used against the grain of their original intention. I don't, well, I, are you assuming the original intention was negative? <laughs> um, I assume that it's a tool, and I assume that tools um, will be used in ways that are um, most useful or most gratifying to people who are given who are who have access to them. Um, I think that if you're asking me, given the point we're making about artists, if there was a fear that gatekeepers or since the gatekeepers were preventing people from being successful, then, and the tools let them circumvent that, then that's what people will use the tools for. I, that's kind of what I assume. So I don't necessarily assume that the tools 
themselves are good or bad. But I do worry, and we've had conversations in this series already that about this, that I don't know that people thought carefully about how the tools could be misused. And that seems problematic to me. Um, it's, it's, it seems to me that you could, you, some, of the things, some of the things that have happened that I think we could agree on, we'll talk about this in a bit, are not the best could have been predicted. I don't know how far in advance, but to some extent were, were foreseeable and people didn't seem to be that concerned, even when there were hints that, for example, it might be affecting mental health. For example, the negativity was um, particularly powerful and easy to spread. When people had started to have a sense that that was true, I don't think we backtracked. So in that sense, I think it's problematic, but that's not the tools themselves. That's how they were used and how they were monetized and, and these sorts of things. Well, I often ask myself, you know, like, if we go back to, I think it was fall 2021 when the whistleblower um, thing happened at Facebook, when it was still called Facebook, right? Um, it wasn't really a surprise to anyone that they had done studies showing that their platforms, particularly Instagram, had had this negative impact on the mental health of girls and women in particular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think about going through childhood or adolescence and getting a metric every time you have a social interaction, it sounds pretty horrifying, right? So it's probably going to be bad for your mental health. So I don't think anyone was surprised. But what I keep asking myself, Brian, is, you know, you said, I think people, I think we saw this coming. But I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. Like, when when did we see it coming? I think that by maybe 2015 or 2016, that there was a, a kind of heightened cynicism, or at least awareness about privacy questions. So around the time that I was writing The End of Forgetting, I think definitely people were beginning to shift. But if we go back to 2000 and five or 2006, 2007, I don't know. Did, did people anticipate what this world that we're living in now? No, you know? I don't, I think 2005, no, I don't know. I, I mean, first of all, like I can't even remember what 2005 was. So let me just be clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a pandemic, something, some stuff happened in between then and now that it makes it a little yeah. bit. Um, but, I, you know, I think if you were to ask a science fiction writer or someone to pre predict out in the future, I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't take too hard to generate a dystopian future based on the technologies that were being produced. Once you had things like likes and I mean, if anyone, let me, let me say it differently. Anyone who's been in middle school should have been like, Hmm, this might not go well. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know when we figured, figured it out, but I, I don't, I mean, I don't know what other people's middle school experience was, but if you told me we're going to put everything that you do on this public forum and then we're going to let people vote on how they feel about it, more or less, and then we're going to have you look at that all the time, that would not sound good to me. It, it, no, exactly. Right. I think everyone I think everyone would have agreed that that was going to be a really, you know, terrible, terrible idea. Um, but for whatever reason, we just all kind of sat back and watched it happen, right? And like, that is that is what is so interesting to me. I think if we also go back to that time, um, I've been working on this new book about, <clears throat> so it's on a kind of funny topic. It's actually about the history of high school yearbooks, just speaking of horrible, you know, experiences in adolescence. And one of the things I discovered is um, that, a lot of the information now used for people search companies, um, but also all of those images on Ancestry.com, sites like that, there are tens of thousands of images that come from high school yearbooks. And so during that early part of the internet, we were actually taking, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, that's when people begin to collect all these materials and start to digitize them we couldn't quite have anticipated how they were going to end up being used. And I think that that, that, is, that is why a lot of these problems happened, is that we might have seen something terrible coming, but we didn't know how we were all contributing to it. Because I think that, that that's what is, is troubling, is that we're all part of the problem.
right? We were all sharing our materials. We were scanning things. We were tagging things online. We were liking things. And so we're all part of the larger problem that we're now trying to grapple with. And not everybody wants to take responsibility. <laughs> That's true. I, I agree with that completely. I think we all participated, to, you know, to differing levels. So I, I, I don't think anyone is completely innocent. I think there's something about human nature that makes these things compelling, which is why you have, I don't know, whatever it is, 5 billion people on, on Facebook or something like that. I, I wonder, how do you think this is, has changed us or is changing us? Do you think that we were different, not just as a society, obviously the, there's been a lot of changes in how society functions because of social media, but do you think people are different? Do we have different expectations of each other? Do we have different expectations of ourselves? Do we think about our futures differently? Like, are we different because of these changes? I, I think we are <clears throat> in, in, in many different ways. I mean, I think that our relationship to the past has changed. I think we, um, you know, one of the things that motivated me to write The End of Forgetting was just thinking about, you know, I realized around 2015, 2016, how profoundly different the experience of the students arriving in my first year classes was compared to the experience I had back in the late 1980s going off to college. You know, I just left. Maybe I stayed in touch with a couple of people. It was incredibly selective. It was very much in my control. And I just started my life again. Um, students now arrive in college with this whole network of people. In some cases, people they've been connected to since they were in kindergarten or first grade. And so they're traveling through life with this sort of in a way, it's it's beautiful because they're tethered to the past in a way that you couldn't be before, but you also give something up. And that has clearly had some kind of profound psychological, social, cultural impact on us. And I think we're still working out the extent to which that's the case. Hmm. I mean, and so I'm, I'm happy you brought up the end of forgetting. I, this is, I'm really interested in, and how you how you think about that. Do you think if given a choice, people would say like, yeah, I, if I could remember everything about my life, I would. Or would they say like, no, I, I'm, if in, as opposed to not being able to selectively forget, but just things are going to be forgotten. But Brian, have you seen any of those films about what happens when you can't forget? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I have. But people seem to be opting for that, right? Is that not what we're, is that not in part what you're saying is happening? Yeah, and I think, I just think, I mean, we we know that we actually forget more negative than positive things that happen to us. You know, we, we know that, um, you know, you have to forget certain things in order to learn new things. For me, forgetting is, is on the one hand, forgetting is incredibly dangerous. So particularly political forgetting, right? So forgetting about atrocities, forgetting about... Um, you know, all the inequities that have, have structured our past is a problem. And I'm, you know, still, I wrote, I spent, before I wrote that book, I spent many years writing about, about archives and, and working in memory studies. So I still have that position. But I also think if you remember too much, you give up the freedom to reimagine yourself and to imagine a, a different world. So for me, there is, um, um, it, it's a psychological um, question, but I'm not a psychologist. So I think about this more in terms of the political consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I am a psychologist, so I do think about those consequences. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> I, um, the thing I wonder or worry about it changing is our ability to evolve. Right. So I, I, for most of us, I assume that there's some version of who we were in the past that we are happy we aren't now, that we, we see that as growth and change in ways that we um, hold dear. And it's a, a big part of who we are at this moment that we were something and that now we're something else and something better. And I wonder if not being able to forget makes it harder 
to evolve. I wonder if you have a sense of that. Well, there's two things. I mean, there's there's the kind of forgetting your past so you can not just feel, you know, ashamed and humiliated and immobilized, right, by, you know, mistakes you've made or things you've said that you regret, etc. But there's also um, being the importance of being forgotten by others. So much of our ability to keep changing and evolving has to do with others, not remembering everything we ever said, everything we ever did, and holding us to that. And I've thought a lot about how our current political situation and its sort of cal increasingly calcified sort of positioning of people's politics is related to the inability to forget and be forgotten. And so if you think about, you know, your digital footprint kind of defining who you are, it is much more difficult for people to change their political position now than it was in the past, because it might mean trying to completely reinvent yourself from scratch on every social media platform that you've ever logged on to. And that, you know, is, is itself an incredible, an incredible challenge. Um, we also know of all those incidents where people are held, you know, asked to account for something they said online 15, 16, 17 years ago, sometimes when they were in middle school or early high school. And maybe that's good, right? Again, I think that my own kids and a lot of my, the students I teach would say, yeah, if you say something problematic online, you have to live with that for the rest of your life. And that's good. But it does make it challenging for people to reimagine or reposition themselves. Mm. I thought you said you were a psychologist. You sound a lot like a psychologist here, Kate. I'm just going to tell you. That. Pardon? <laughs> you sound a lot like a psychologist here. <laughs> you, know, you know, I was you know. surprised that that book, that, that book was uh, was sort of taken up uh, in, in psychology. And and I'm, I'm always saying interviews, but I, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't, I can't <laughs> tell that. I don't want to I don't want to get out of my lane, Brian. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, I get out of my lane all the time. That's what gets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I do want to um, pick up on something you said. Um, people say things online, let's say when they're teenagers and then they're in their 20s right now and, and they still are having lived that down or can't live that down. I wonder how this absence of forgetting affects forgiveness. And you also pointed to like, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. Like what what is what are these technologies doing to the ability for us to allow people to change? I think they're making it more difficult. Um, it's, you know, not only are people more likely to end up living in these very kind of small, narrowly defined filter bubbles and not to bump into other ideas that they don't already sort of support, but simultaneous to that, we have, you know, everyone's detritus is sort of out there, right? And it, it can be very difficult for, for people to reinvent themselves, adopt a new position, and then integrate themselves into a different community. And so on the one hand, again, some people would say, well, you know, it's great that there's this heightened accountability, but if that heightened accountability closes off the opportunity for change and transformation, particularly the kind of change in perspective you might undergo when you leave home and go to college and encounter new people in a new context, that, that worries me, you know? Um, so I do think it's, it's, it's impacted people's ability to forgive as well. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it certainly seems that way. And it also, and this is something else you've been pointing to, it also seems to limit serendipity a little bit, right? So you, it's easy to find people like you to be with the people who you've known in the past, to maintain, to generate a community that feels comfortable and safe and to main that, maintain that community long-term. But also that also seems to be on the other side, like a, a loss in serendipity and, and possibility and and just discovery, 
And I, I wonder if, if that's also a part of the not forgetting. Is Are those things related in your mind? I, I think they are. And I'm going to pause it for one second in order to plug in my computer. Can you believe that I didn't plug in my computer before the interview, Brian? <laughs> it happens. It happens. I, I was thinking, you know, then, then we could just forget this whole conversation. <laughs> I, I will run to another meeting and maybe forget everything that we've discussed in yeah. the next hour. But I have but you know what? It will be on YouTube. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's pick it up with 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 the serendipity now that I'm 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 at one percent and on my way back up again. Okay. Um a- absolutely. So I do think that you know the the surprise, the um, the unexpected, um, you know, the 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 delightful coincidence. All of those things seem to be constrained when we find ourselves in this this space where everything is always is always being kind of tracked and, and reproduced and, and fed back to us. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I this is something I've, I've thought a, a, quite a bit about because I think I mentioned when we started that I have I have a book about the construction of self. And one of the chapters is, is a bit about this, that um, the technology is making it hard for us to have that serendipity, that the, the, the surprise in terms of the way the self expands and I don't know. I, I personally think it, the delight in learning something about yourself that you didn't know. Um, I think it's harder to do that um, with the way current technologies function. And so that seems to me to be a loss. At the same time, as you pointed out, no, no technologies are inherently good or bad. I think it's also really powerful that people can generate communities that um, feel safe for them and maintain those communities. And, and when in the past, that might have been really difficult to do. So I do think there are there benefits on the other side. Well, that's like another question is, you know, and I was going to sort of pose this earlier on, is on the one hand, there are definitely political movements that have been able to coalesce and, and gain a kind of visibility that they wouldn't have uh, been able to do in the past or been able to to accelerate at a pace that would have not been possible back in, let's say, the 90s. Hmm. Um, But have we seen the emergence of communities that have had a real political impact? Hmm. And so I'm thinking, like, on the one hand, I can say, you know, as a queer person, I definitely would say that, you know, the internet has been... um, had an incredible impact on the lives of LGBTQ youth. And it's not a coincidence that early on, even on like sites like GeoCities, there were trans teenagers creating communities on those very early, you know, user, sort of, sort of user-friendly um, virtual sites like GeoCities. On the other hand, the, you know, the same, the same platforms over time have been used to perpetuate a lot of hate. And I, I'm currently teaching a course on digital feminism and we're spending quite a bit of time reading about black digital feminism. So on the one hand, it's been this incredible space for black women to connect and you know, gain a kind of visibility and that, that didn't exist before. And then on the other hand, we're also living in a time rife with sexism and racism and a lot of rights have been rolled back. So how do we grapple with that? Yeah, I mean, and I've had this, I've had this debate with a few people. Um, I'm sure you have. (laughs) (laughs) Like on the one hand, obviously um, it's just a tool and as an organizing tool, it can be really powerful. The thing that I point to that is, gets me not in trouble, but starts the, turns the debate into a, a, a friendly argument is that I say something like, I don't know that it deepens connections within the community, meaning it may be, you can generate a big community in part because it's easy and there's a cost to that ease, which is that it's not as deep and as committed and as organized as it would be if you went through the 
uh, some more um, traditional channels of meeting people and organizing. Um, and, you know, I think that's debatable, but to your point of have we seen communities that have had deep political impact, I think deep political impact requires a kind of on the ground organizing that may not be um, as easy to do online as the simple act of finding supportive people. Yeah, I mean, I think about this one, you know, particularly if you're on a site like, you know, it's not even really a social media site, but something like LinkedIn. And so there'll be lots of posts, um, you know, prominent minority leaders in business. And that's great. Okay. So there's this, on the surface, it looks like corporate America is changing, but on the ground, we know who's being paid less whose working conditions are, are problematic, um, who has fewer opportunities for, for promotions, right? And so it, I, I sometimes feel that that visibility creates an illusion of progress, um, it, particularly in the, in the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna say one thing that's really cynical, cynical and I'm gonna move on. That <laughs> it may be, it may be that that is some of what some actors want, right? It provides an opportunity to present a version of the organization or the self that that provides a benefit without having to actually do the hard work. Um, and even even in people's personal lives, I, this is this is not cynical. This actually happened. I was at a dinner, I don't know, some years ago, five years ago, or something. And there was a person that was about to go on a, a date from, with someone they met on online, some online, online dating app. And I don't know what happened, but I said, oh, do you meet people at, you know, where I was in New York, do you meet people at bars, wherever? She's like, why would I ever do that? Like, I can't vet those people. Like, in essence, <laughs> it's like horribly inefficient to just meet people on the street or, in, you know, and through serendipity, because now I have to go through the time and effort of figuring out things about this person or learning about this person where I can just read their resume and decide whether I want to at least have as a pre-screen, whether I want to spend any time with them or not. So I think both for different reasons, but corporate entities, indiv individuals um, understand to some extent the value of what's being offered. Um, and, and this is, again, my cynical view, like are taking advantage of that and are, aren't so concerned about what others would perceive as the cost, like a corporation, maybe they don't want to do the hard work of figuring out how to deal with um, inequity because it's a lot, it's hard, you know, but you also want to demonstrate to people that you care about it. Right? This is That's why you hire, this comes back to our original discussion about content. So you hire a content strategist to make sure that, you know, on LinkedIn and other sites, you look like the company that is doing all of these things, whether or not you're actually doing them doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But I think individuals yeah. are doing some version of that too, right? Like individuals are saying like, how can I take, make use of this without all, how can I cut back on some of the hard work that I normally have to do and get what I want out of life without going and actually having to talk to real people? Uh, so I, you know, it's, I think it's all around. You see maybe people changing um, and incorporating these tools into how they live. To optimizing their, their, their sociality. But of course, they're not they're not writing the algorithm. Right. So then, you, you know, this person you're talking to, they're relying on, you know, the grinder or Tinder's algorithm to vet who they're they're going to go on a date with. Right. It would be different if we were coming up with, you know, all the criteria, but mm. we're not. Um, so we're true. just getting this really particular version or lens fed back to us. Great. So now I'm going to move away from my cynicism for a moment and, okay. and, and say, I, you know, you know, I, I was expecting you to be a lot more optimistic. So, <laughs> so, so, so you have to spend more time with me, Kate. You have to spend more time with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <clears throat> there's obviously cost to the kind of the direction we've gone, in particular with social media. And as you mentioned a number of times, particularly like, young women and girls have, have we seen higher rates of depression and, and negative mental health outcomes as a function of engagement with social media. Um, Josh Howley recently suggested we ban kids 
from social media or ban social media from kids, depending on however you want to say it. What do you what do you think about that stance? Well, you know, I always think I, I, I tried to ban television in my house. And I have to say my kids watched a lot of TV when they were growing up. They just watched it on their phone instead. So, you know, it, it both on a personal level and if we look at the sort of long history of <clears throat> attempting to ban different types of media, particularly for children, it never works. People have tried to ban radio, comic books, films, you know, um, games. People are still trying to ban games because um, apparently they lead everyone to become violent. Um, yeah, so that I don't agree with. I also think, you know, the fact that young people, children and adolescents for the first time in history are able to document their own lives and broadcast those images and texts widely is really incredible. That's incredible. It's, it's really exciting that they no longer have to rely on adults to do that for them. Um, that said, I, I would be more interested in focusing not on the problem with social media platforms, but how they have come to be used and their relationship to capitalism. And if I can say it, neoliberalism, right? So I see social media platforms extending or amplifying practices that have already been in place for a very long time. And that is what I think we need to address, not the platforms themselves. Um, and maybe this comes back to something I said earlier. On the one hand, you know, we're all of us, you and I, everyone who's listening to this, we're all responsible for kind of, for creating this mess that is social media in 2023 and beyond. But because we're responsible for creating it, we have some small hope of maybe changing it for the better. Good, that leads me to my last Two questions, or it's a, let's call it a combo question. Okay. Um, <laughs> as you think about how the era of content creation, the social media, how that's changed how we live, um, it's changed in this conversation, it's, it's changed how we relate to our pasts, um, it changes how we engage with each other, and in some sense, I think it's changed us in some significant way like the society, but also us as individuals, how, how we engage with the world. As you think about that and you think about the future, what are your fears and what are your hopes? I mean, my, my fear is that people think complacency is the only way forward, that, that we forget that we can make choices. We we can't undo what we've created. I think that, um, you know, to come back to our early conversation about, you know, when, like, when did we see that this was going to go down a bad path and, and decide not to, to prevent it from happening? Um, that's a hard question to answer. But I do think that we need to, even though we can't undo everything, I think it's important for everyone to remember that they can potentially shift the situation we currently have. And my, my hope is that, um, that we embrace that challenge. You know, I don't think we're going to, sometimes, you know, people talk about, is it possible to have a search engine that's not connected to advertising? Is it possible, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not that optimistic, but I do think that there are, that we can make inroads into building a more equitable, um, safer, less exploitative online space. Well, I, I certainly hope we can. So I'll share that hope with you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. I really enjoyed the conversation. Great. So this is our last conversation in the People and Planet in the Information Era series. Uh, if you wanna stay in touch with the program, uh, and hear my podcast, you can visit knowwhatyousee.com. Um, and thanks for joining us. See you all next time.